Pyramid dice, roll until you bust. Eight shakes is all it takes to break my bank and win some cash. Throw the dice and feel real Casino nice. games, like this one here, are designed to be flashy and fun, yet mathematically created so the casino wins in the long run. I went on a mathematical adventure to determine how rigged this pyramid dice game was, and I want to show you the techniques that I used to solve this unique combinatorics problem. One million smackers. Hey you then, how about a game? You want to give it a try? Sure thing. Great. First, I'll need a wager. Just one dollar gets you shaking some bacon. Excellent. Now take a look at the pyramid. It has the 21 unique ways you can roll two simple six-sided dice. You got your box cars to snake eyes, that's double sixes to double ones along this side, and 15 non-doubles that you roll either way. Flip them or flop them, doesn't matter to me. Now every time you roll the dice, I'm gonna mark it off here. You keep rolling and rolling until you rolled something you rolled before. You're doing great. Keep on moving and grooving. Alrighty. Since you already rolled a six and a two, you've busted. I know it's sad, but ten shakes before then means you won a prize. If we look at all the payouts down here, we'll see that you win your original bet plus three times in addition. In total, four dollars. Should we play again? Yes, but only for educational purposes. Ouch! That's no good. You need at least seven shakes to get your money back. Looks like the house wins this time. The dice are still yours if you want to keep playing. Yes, I need one more test case. Well, seven rolls ain't good, but it ain't bad neither. That's what we call a push. You get your bet back, nobody wins, nobody loses. Let's go again and win you some cash to take home. I appreciate the examples. Now, I have to go teach. You sure? If you win here, you won't have to teach no more. Well, all right then, come on back if you ever feel like winning, because this here is the greatest game in town. Pyramid dice, roll until you bust. Eight shakes. What did y'all think of that game? Casino games, all of them, are meant to make you, the player, feel like you could win, but statistically speaking, you will lose in the long run. What does your mathematical intuition say about this pyramid dice game, given what you observed from those examples? Do you think the odds are stacked against the player by a lot, or by a little? We can quantify how much the player is expected to win using something called the expected value, or EV for short. Casino games always have negative expected values because they need to gradually take the player's money so the casino stays in business. A typical casino game has an expected value between a negative quarter of a percent and negative 5%, depending on the rules chosen by the casino. Suppose a roulette player bets $1 on red. If they are right, they win an additional dollar. However, if black or green comes up, they lose their dollar wager. There is an 18 in 37 chance of seeing a red, an 18 in 37 chance of seeing a black, and a 1 in 37 chance of seeing the green zero. If we multiply the payouts by the probabilities and add them up, we get the negative 2.7% expected value seen in this table. A higher EV means the game is better for the player, but any negative EV means players will lose money in the long run. A game with a slightly negative EV just means players lose their money more slowly. I came across Pyramid Dice when reading about old casino games, but could not find any published expected value for the game. So I set off trying to calculate the EV myself to see if this game would be a fun addition to my Dungeons & Dragons campaign. My goal for you is to get a peek into how I solve combinatorics problems like this one, so you can be better equipped to solve such problems in the future. To calculate expected value, I find it helpful to make a spreadsheet of all possible outcomes, the value of those outcomes, that is the amount won or lost, and the probability of those outcomes happening. An outcome in Pyramid Dice is how many unique rolls the player made before losing. That can be any whole number from 1 to 21. Note the zero outcome is impossible because a player cannot lose on their first roll. The wager is lost for outcomes less than 7, which we indicate by putting negative 1 in those cells. The push at 7 means the player comes out even, so they earn 0. 
For 8 and up, we use the payout value, because that is how much the player gains from rolling that many unique rolls. In a book by Mark Bullman, I did find the probability for two cases, losing on the second roll, that is the 1 outcome, and winning the grand prize, the 21 outcome. Those are 5.093%, and 1 in about 287 million, respectively. Like before, we calculate the expected value by multiplying the value and the probability cells together, and then adding them all up, which we can do with a sum product function. This table is missing a lot of probability values, but that is where the calculation comes in. If we can find a closed form formula to help us fill in the probability distribution across all these outcomes, we will have the expected value. Our goal is to eventually define the function lose that takes in a parameter r, the number of unique rolls made before losing. My approach to discovering probability formulas is to write out the probabilities of the first few outcomes and then try to spot the patterns. Let's start with the probability of lose 1, that is, losing on the second roll, having achieved one unique roll. One way this outcome can happen is if the first roll is a double like 3 3. There are six rolls out of 36 that are a double like this. To bust on the second roll, it would need to be that exact same double, which is only a 1 in 36 chance. We multiply these two fractions together because both events need to happen for the outcome to happen. The second way the player can achieve this outcome is to roll a non-double first. There are 30 ways to roll a non-double, like this 1-4 on the first roll, then two different ways to bust, either by rolling 1-4 or 4-1. That means there is a 2 in 36 chance to bust on the second roll with non-doubles. We add both of these together to get the probability for this outcome, which is 5.0926%. This matches the textbook value I found earlier, a good sign. Because I want to try to spot patterns with the numbers, I'm not going to simplify or combine these fractions yet. Keeping them separate tends to make pattern finding easier. Let's move on to the probability of outcome 2. We could roll a double first, and then a different double second, then bust by re-rolling either of these. We could also roll a non-double first, and then a different non-double second, and then there would be four ways to bust, two ways from either non-double. The third way to achieve this outcome is to roll a double first, and then a non-double second, and then bust by re-rolling any of the three non-unique rolls. The fourth and final way is a mirrored version of the third way, in which a player rolls a non-double first, a double second, and then busts with any of the three non-unique rolls. This is suddenly a lot of terms, so I want to borrow a technique from my career as a software engineer and encapsulate some of the terms into functions. Mathematicians make up functions all the time, just like programmers, so I'm making up a function called bust, which takes two inputs, d, a number of doubles, and n, a number of non-doubles, and represents the probability of busting after rolling any arrangement of those rolls. Introducing this function lets me fit more on the page and deal with smaller sub-problems instead of one large problem. It can also make patterns more apparent. For consistency, I'll add the functions to the first outcome as well. I use the bust functions to sketch out the components that add up to the probability of outcome 3. We could have 3 doubles, or 3 non-doubles, or some mixes of the two. Let's rearrange things so we start with all doubles and work up to non-doubles. Patterns are sometimes easier to spot if you sort your terms or data. Using similar logic as before, we can expand this first term, bust 3, 0. Ok, I'm spotting one pattern already, the number of 36's in the denominator. Lose 1 had 2 of them lose 2 had 3 of them, and now lose 3 has 4 of them. What we can do is pull out the 36's out front, and make note that our bust function will not refer to a probability, but the numerator of the probability. We can sketch out some details for the general formula. The formula has a 1 over 36 to the r plus 1 up front, and adds up some bust terms for the rest. A second thing that jumps out at me is the 6 times 5 times 4 term, and shortened versions of that earlier. From experience with combinatorics problems before, I think this might be related to a factorial, perhaps 6 factorial divided by 3 factorial. This happens to have a special name and notation, called a falling factorial, but I'm not a huge fan of the underlined superscript notation because I easily confuse it with exponentiation, so I just use factorial fractions. Let's rewrite the first terms using these factorials. We can expand bust 0, 3 in a similar way, and like the all doubles term, I notice a pattern with 30 times 28 times 26. As it turns out, this can be described using double factorials, which are like regular factorials, but decrementing by 2 each time instead of 1. Falling double factorial is not a real thing, but we could expand the falling factorial notation to have a double underline if we wanted. Like before though, I'm going to stick to double factorial fractions. 
We can take this time to pencil in components that make up the bust function, some factorials or double factorials, and some other terms that we still need to figure out. Expanding these remaining two bust functions may give us more insight there. If you want to test your combinatoric skills, pause the video now and work them out. Here's what bust 2, 1 expands to. The 6, 5, and 30 come from the chances of rolling a double, a different double, and then a non-double. The 4 refers to the rolls that could cause a bust. This 3 corresponds to the three orders the rolls could have happened in. The non-double could have happened last, second, or first. Bust 1, 2 expands into something similar, with a key difference being the five rolls that cause a bust. One goal with closed form formulas is to write all magic numbers, like this 4, in terms of the inputs if possible. Can we get this 4 in terms of d and n? Recall that this 4 corresponds to the four rolls that result in the player busting by re-rolling something they have rolled before. This 2 corresponds with the two ways to re-roll either of the two doubles. Let's break our subproblem into a sub-subproblem with another function called re-roll. It will also have two inputs and correspond to how many ways we can re-roll our d doubles and n non-doubles. Do you see how that function might be calculated? Right, we can have re-roll be equal to d times 2n, since there is only one way to roll a double, but two ways to roll a non-double. This function made our equations longer, yet more organized and manageable. Focusing on the middle terms, corresponding to rolling both doubles and non-doubles, I noticed something familiar about this 2 with these 3s underneath. It reminds me of Pascal's triangle, with this 2 and these 3s underneath. The values in Pascal's triangle are known as binomial coefficients, which correspond to calculating combinations, also called choosing. Asking the question, how many ways are there to arrange two doubles and one non-double, is the same as asking what is 3 choose 2. Let's replace all these with r choose d, where we have r rolls and d doubles. For completeness, and to make patterns easier to spot, let's expand the r choose d even where it would be 1, along the edges of Pascal's triangle. The final values to deal with are these like 6 times 5 times 30. We saw those values in the factorials and double factorial expansions. Because the factorials corresponded with rolling doubles, and the double factorials corresponded with rolling non-doubles, what if we use both a factorial fraction and a double factorial fraction multiplied together? I realize this makes the formula seem even more complicated, but notice the nice patterns that arise in the denominators. The denominator for 6 factorial starts small, but increments by 1 going left to right. Symmetrically, the denominator for 30 double factorial ends big and increases by 2 going right to left. In fact, we can extend the pattern by adding factorial and double factorial terms that cancel out to 1. By extending the pattern, I now see how to complete the bust equation using the n and d parameters. The last thing we need to do is codify how many bust terms we are adding up and what parameters to pass in. Notice that the d parameter starts at the number of rolls and goes down to 0. We can use the summation notation to indicate that, using d as the summation index. I'm going to add a little question mark above the equal sign because at this point we have no proof or verification that this is correct. We will deal with that in a bit. Back in our spreadsheet, I left some space for calculating the lose function. Specifically, each of these cells will be a bust calculation, and we will add them up. Each column corresponds to a total number of rolls before losing, and each row corresponds to a number of doubles rolled along the way. Sheets has a function for factorial and double factorials, as well as one for r choose d, called combin, short for combination. I'm making use of partial absolute references with these dollar signs because hopefully I can write the formula once and drag it right and down to fill it out to all the bust cells. We need to sum bust cells from 0 to r, that is 0 to 1, so we have two total cells for our first outcome. The denominator goes down here, which is 36 to the r plus 1 power, and then we sum up all the bust cells from above and divide by that denominator. Oh good, 5.09% matches up with the value from Bullman's textbook, a nice double check. Let's start filling in more columns. The lose 2 column has three terms to add up, 
and each additional column has one more term because our summation is from 0 to r. The percentages we calculated so far seem reasonable, in the sense that they are not negative nor greater than 100%, and so far they add up to less than 100%, which is a good sign as well. As we get to the 7 rolls column, we need to make a small adjustment to our formula. I thought the sum index variable should go from 0 to r, but if we try to roll 7 doubles, we get an error because of a negative factorial. I now see that there will be at most 7 terms, corresponding to the 0 through 6 doubles rolled before busting. What we can do is change our sum index to either stop at 6 or r, whichever it hits first. Then we can delete all these extra rows because we won't need the values they represent. We can keep copying our formula over, uh, and we'll need to make one final adjustment at the 16 rolls column. If the player busts after 16 unique rolls, they cannot have rolled 0 doubles because there are only 15 unique non-doubles. This error manifests as a negative double factorial, and we can solve it in a similar fashion as before. Change the sum indices to start at 0, or r minus 15, whichever is bigger. With this, I see no more errors when filling out the remaining cells. Having no calculation errors does not mean this formula or our calculations are correct, however. The first step in verifying probabilities is adding them all up and seeing if that equals 100%. This does, which means it is a valid probability distribution. This might not be the correct distribution though, so the way I verified it was to write some simulation code to try playing the game lots of times. This snippet of code which is also linked in the description, rolls two six-sided dice, sorts the values low to high to make uniqueness checking easier, and then sees if that roll is already in the set of rolls thus far. If it is, that is a bust, and the function returns how many rolls there were before the bust occurred. Otherwise, the code adds the roll to the set and rolls again. This other loop ran that simulation 1.5 billion times. Why 1.5 billion? There was a rule of thumb I heard in a stats class where you would want to simulate something until each outcome should happen at least five times, and with the least likely outcome happening one in 287 million times, 1.5 billion meets that objective. This table compares the values from our formula on the left to the simulated values on the right. The columns are extremely close, so I feel very confident the formula is correct. The error is a bit larger for 19 rolls and above, but I believe that is just statistical fluctuation due to the very low probabilities of those outcomes. If we take the formula values and plug them into our expected value calculations, we find that Pyramid Dice has an EV of negative 12.37%. That incredibly unfavorable EV probably explains why this game is not in many casinos anymore. Players lose too quickly. Now that we have this distribution though, we can put ourselves in the shoes of a game designer and try different payouts. For example, what if we take the original payouts, but have the player win with 7 rolls instead of it being a push? This moves the EV to negative 1.8%, more in line with other casino games. We could trim this payout for 12 rolls to be 6 to push the odds a bit more in the casino's favor if we like. We can also try to invent new wagers, like letting a better place a wager against the player, and if the player does not make it past 6 rolls, the better wins half their wager. Oops, that is a positive EV, so the casino would lose money. Let's try one third of their wager instead. That's better, for the casino anyway. Let me know in the comments about any wagers you come up with that I could use in my Dungeons & Dragons version of Pyramid Dice. The biggest takeaway I hope you have from this is how casino games are designed for players to lose money. As far as problem solving takeaways go, I hope you saw how breaking a big problem into smaller ones by defining functions and implementing them can make a problem more manageable and make patterns easier to spot. I use functions this way both in solving math problems and programming problems. Simulating with computer code is a great tool for combinatorics problems, but there are some problems where even our fastest computers cannot compute the results. For such problems, we need mathematics to give us closed form solutions or proofs of existence. Mythologer and stand-up maths each have a great example of problems beyond our computing power, but still within our mathematical power, and I highly recommend them. Happy learning!